Grace and mercy and peace be with you, dear friends in Christ, from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Today we are in the ninth chapter of the story. The story is again taking us from the beginning of the story of the scriptures all the way to the end. And today we are in the story of Ruth. Ruth is uh, a small book in the Old Testament. A small book. It's just four chapters long. So actually if you were reading it in the story version of, of, of like the, the book that we have, uh, you're reading almost the entire thing. You could probably read it just as fast right from the Bible itself. So I would encourage you to do that as well. The story of Ruth is just four chapters long, and the story of Ruth uh, is short enough that I would actually like to uh, just retell this story to you very briefly, uh, because some of you may not have had the chance to read it, but we always need to hear these things again. So I want to tell the story quickly, and then we'll, we'll apply it and put some, put some skin on it. Okay? So the story of Ruth occurs during the time of the judges. Last week in chapter 8, we were in the time of the judges. All right, That's quite a time frame, but the story of Ruth takes place somewhere in there. There was a woman named Naomi, and she and her husband and their two sons lived in Bethlehem. You've heard of Bethlehem before because that's where Jesus is born, right? So Naomi and her husband and their two sons live in Bethlehem, but there's a big famine that's happening there at the time. And so uh, they did kind of what was customary. When a famine happened, you needed to go find food. And so they left Bethlehem. Bethlehem is in modern-day Israel. They went a little bit to the west, crossed the Jordan River into a region called Moab. It's not that far away, but a little more mountainous region. And so that's where they went, and they lived there for a while. Naomi, her husband, and two sons. The two sons, while they were there, got married to, to Moabite women. One's name was Ruth, and one was... Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah, okay? Ruth and Orpah, married to the two sons of Naomi. Well, during this time, we don't really know why all the men died. Naomi's husband died, and the two sons died. So here's a foreign woman with two daughters-in-law, these foreign women, and this wasn't a good place for single women to be, kind of a, a difficult place for Naomi, and she was getting old, and she was barren, and she had heard now that the famine was ending back in Bethlehem. And so she said to her daughters-in-law, you know what, I'm going to go back home. You go back to your people, and I'm going to go home to my people. Orpah took her up on the deal, and she went home, but Ruth said no. Ruth said no. Ruth said, I am going to follow after you. Right? These are the words that Ruth said to her. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. See, the Moabites didn't worship the one true God. They worshiped these other false gods. And so she, in a sense, is saying, I am going to follow after the one true God. All right, so Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem. When they get back to Bethlehem, though, Naomi is too old to work, and Ruth has made a commitment to take care of her mother-in-law. So Ruth goes out, and she finds a field where they're gathering the harvest. And, and Ruth came behind and basically picked up the scraps from the field. And she was picking up scraps and bringing them home to feed her and Naomi. The guy who owned the field, though, his name was Boaz. And Boaz noticed this woman and saw her hard work and, and, and said to his workers, I want you to protect her. A, a single woman out in the field, that was kind of a dangerous place for her to be. And so she received the protection of these farmers. And he also said, give her enough food to go home and feed Naomi and Ruth. So this happened, and then Ruth and Naomi found out that Boaz was a man called, he was a redeemer, all right? In the Old Testament law, in the Book of the Covenant, there were stipulations for a, a person called a kinsman redeemer. That was like a close relative who had responsibility to take care of a near, a near relative, to purchase property at the time of death, and sometimes also to get married and have children on behalf of the deceased. All right, so Boaz, or Naomi and Ruth say, all right, we're going to go to Boaz and see if he will redeem us. So they concoct this plan, and Ruth uh, comes to Boaz, and Boaz says, I am a redeemer, but you have a closer kinsman redeemer, a closer family member who is actually supposed to purchase your land and uh, give children through Ruth. So, but Boaz wants to do it. 
So Boaz goes to the actual kinsman redeemer and says, okay, redeemer, Naomi has a plot of land to sell. Would you like to purchase it? You are her redeemer. And that redeemer says, yes, I would. And then Boaz says, but if you do that, you are also, uh, you are also redeeming Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth. And you are making a commitment to uh, have children with her so that the inheritance can be passed to her as, a, as an inheritance. And that redeemer says, oh, I can't do that because I would mess up my inheritance. And so Boaz makes an offer and says, here, have my shoe. <laughs> okay, that's how they made deals. So he gave him a sandal and he purchased the land from him. You can read about it in the Bible, what happens, right? So he gives him his sandal and they make this deal. And Boaz ends up redeeming that land and also marrying Ruth. And through Ruth and that marriage, they have a child. They name him Obed. Obed has a son named Jesse. Jesse has a son named David who will become king over Israel. In this story, in this story, we have a few key themes that I would like to talk about and how that will actually play out in our lives as well. The first key theme that I would like to look at is this. The kingdom of God is for all people. The kingdom of God is for all people. Boaz is an Israelite. Ruth is a Moabite. The Moabites did not worship the creator, Yahweh. Okay? They didn't worship the one true God. They worshiped other gods. Technically, Boaz probably shouldn't have even married Ruth. But somehow, through this unique marriage, through this mixed marriage of races and religions, God actually worked his plan. Because not only is Ruth the great-grandmother of David, but also as we read about in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus, this also puts Ruth in the lineage of Jesus himself. You know what this means? The kingdom of God is for all people. The kingdom of God is for all people. People, God came to purchase and win back all people. God created all people, and his love is for all people. The second key theme is this. Unity comes through redemption. There was this story, again, of Boaz being the redeemer of Ruth and Naomi, right? He, he purchased them with money. He bought them back. He united himself. Boaz didn't have to do this. Boaz was a pretty wealthy guy with, with, a, with a profitable estate. And, and Ruth was a widow, a poor foreign woman. For him to humble himself and redeem her was quite a great act of humility. Unity in that marriage comes through the redemption that Boaz offers. This idea of the kinsman redeemer throughout the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of what it is that Jesus does for all of us. God redeems the whole world to himself through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Redeeming, purchasing, winning us back. If it were not for Christ, we are held captive by sin and death and the power of the devil. And God has redeemed us through Jesus Christ, not with gold or silver, but with the holy and precious blood of Jesus Christ and his innocent suffering and death for us. Unity in the body of Christ comes in the fact that all of us in our sin have been united with God through the redemption of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is for all people. Unity comes through redemption. And therefore, the third key theme is this that we as God's people are called to live in humility and grace with the whole human race. Humility and grace, this story is filled with humility, right? Naomi says to Ruth and Orpah there in Moab, she says, no, 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 go back home. Naomi is, in a way, humbling herself. She needs their help, but she says, no, 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 it'd be better for you to go home. Naomi's humbling herself. Ruth humbles herself because it would be better for her to probably go back home. Yet she says, no, I will serve you. I will serve your God. Ruth humbles herself. Boaz humbles himself, this wealthy man taking a poor widow to be his wife. Humility and grace is offered 
We as God's people, redeemed by the love of Jesus Christ, are called then to live in our humility, offering the grace of God to all people. You think about these three key themes. How applicable and necessary is this for us in our present day context? To remember that God's kingdom is for all people, that unity only happens through Jesus, and that because we've been united with Christ, we live in that grace and humility. These are practical truths for us in our lives right now. You know, this world, I don't have to tell you this, you know how divided this world is right now. You know of all the various opinions perspectives, dissensions, disagreements, disappointments that exist in this world and particularly in this society right now, right? You're very well aware. And, and the problem, I believe, is that we are all confident that we are right. At least I know I'm right. Right? I told you a story a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think, it was, I think it was on the day that, I, that we installed Marcus uh, about a month ago. I told you a story about um, how stubborn I am. And when I was a little kid, I think I was like three or four, and my, my mom uh, tried to get me to wear a yellow crayon sweater for school pictures, and I kicked and screamed and yelled on the floor. Maybe it's coming back to you now, and I didn't want to do it, and you know how it goes. And I haven't changed all that much, but... Um, my mom won the, the argument that day, and I wore the crayon sweater, and some of you have been asking for proof of it, so here you go. There I am. Cute kid, right? Terrible sweater. So my mom won, right? She got that sweater on me, but the truth is, I would have rather had it a different way. I like to be right. In my sinful, selfish pride, I like to be right. And I know you like to be right as well. Sometimes there are large divides that happen, right? In our society, in our world. And many of those divisions and dissensions and disagreements are propagated even further through the online world and through social media. Some of you live actively in that world. Some of you do not, right? I, I think those are great tools for us, the, the, the internet and the social media, but oftentimes they can just further the angst and the disagreements and the divisions that exist. And sometimes we watch our society being torn apart over disagreements. Last February, February of 2015, there was a worldwide disagreement. A worldwide disagreement. People were strong in their opinions, they fought for their opinions. They belittled the people on the opposing side of the argument, and the world, the world went crazy over this. People were calling each other names and foolish. How foolish were the people of the opposing perspective. You know what I'm talking about? This. <laughs> Remember? This is a dress. Maybe, Glenn, can you put on number five? We'll start to dim it down a little bit. All right. So somebody posted a picture of this dress, if you're not familiar with the story, and it went viral online because people saw this dress differently. Now I want to do a little show of hands so we can figure out who's right here, all right? Some people see this dress as black and blue. The color is black and blue. Raise your hand if you're seeing a black and blue dress right now. The other option is gold and white. Raise your hand if you see gold and white. Okay, put your hands down and I will tell you who is correct because you're gonna side with me. It's gold and white! All right, Glenn, pull, pull the lights back up. All right, I'm serious, I cannot see blue and black on that thing. I look at it, I stare at it, it's gold and white. The real bummer of the deal is the dress is actually black and blue. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> is it? Isn't that crazy? Half of, you are, half of you are seeing it black and blue, half of you sharing it gold and white. I don't know how it works. It's science, I guess. Some of you can figure it out, right? 
Isn't it amazing, you know, if you were to have a debate with the person next to you, you would say, you're crazy. It's black and blue. No, it's blue and white, right? Isn't it amazing to watch as we so quickly divide one another? Now, this is obviously a silly little example. You can take that down. We know, though, we know, though, that there are much more real, prevalent examples of the division and the dissensions that exist in this world. And this last week, man, this last week was pretty tough. This last week was tough on our, on our country, on the world, right? A presidential election has turned into quite a serious battle, right? Quite a serious battle. We've, we've heard what we've heard. We, we've heard people say nasty things. We've, we've seen people do nasty things. We've seen people fight and bicker. We, we've watched candidates say things. We've watched their followers say things. You and I have said and done things. You watch this major division and dissensions happening. We watch crude caricatures of the candidates being portrayed, however true or not they might be. Friends, I don't really know what to say. Other than to simply say that this is a broken world. It's a broken world in which we live. This is a broken world in which we live, and Satan has a heyday when he watches us drive one another apart. But here's the reality of the situation God is in control. He is. He's sovereign. He reigns from beginning to end. And, and I'm not here to preach politics to you, that is not my goal. God has given to you a faith to trust in him. He's given you a rational mind to think and to go and vote. And I pray that you did that prayerfully. Right? And that's enough. I am here. I am here to tell you and to proclaim boldly into your life that no matter how it seems or what it seems, God is 100% absolutely in control. He is. Jesus is Lord ruling and reigning now until the day that he comes again. God has it under control. He does. Right now and forever. Now, we are not little pawns that God moves around on his chessboard. He gives us a free will to think and make decisions, but that doesn't relegate him. It still means that he's sovereign. However that makes sense, it probably doesn't. But it's true. It's true. God is in control. God is in control. And even when we read the scriptures, friends, we've been reading these stories from the Old Testament do you know what kind of people God has been working through? Pretty crummy people. Pretty messed up people. Moses was a murderer. People were doubting, complaining, prostituting themselves, killing one another, worshiping false gods, and God chose them. These are the people that we claim to be biblical superheroes. God works through them. God never demanded perfection for them, but he worked through them despite their sin and despite their weakness. If we believe that God is sovereign, which we do, then we better let him simply be sovereign. And that means he's got it. He has it. He knows what he's doing. And, and not just here in the United States. God's got it. He's got all time in his hands. He's got all people in his hands, all places in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? Not just here in the U.S. He's got Canada and France and Belgium and Russia and Ethiopia and Nigeria and Kazakhstan and Afghanistan and Iraq and, and Australia and New Zealand, which I hear had a big earthquake this morning. He's got Chile and Colombia and Mexico. He's got it all in his hands. God's got it, friends. God's got it. For those of you who fear or worry, I pray that you find your hope today in the fact that God's kingdom is for all people. That redemption unites us as God's people. Redemption, the redemption of Jesus unites us. Live in that. And then, dear friends in Christ, live in humility and grace with all people. I don't know why it happens. Sometimes it happens as I'm writing these sermons where God gives me words, and I don't, I, don't know the, I don't know how God delivers these words to me to deliver to you. I just pray they're sinking in. Sometimes God gives me words to deliver to you that rhyme and have rhythm, and so I guess you could call them poems. And as I was writing this today, or not today, but as I was writing this to proclaim to you today, God gave me some words in poetic form to proclaim to you. And I'd like to end my sermon by speaking these words to you. The family of God 
is made up of all kinds of different people. Yes, even here, all political parties are under this one steeple. There are Israelites and Moabites, like Boaz and Ruth, and all the political parties are here. Seriously, it's the truth. Listen close to these words. The message is clear. The redemption of Jesus is drawing us near. He has bought us back, not with silver or gold, but with his blood poured out and his body left hanging in the cold. Love one another in the name of Christ, I pray. Do it tomorrow. Frankly, do it today. Because God is the only one who will make it all right. So please, family of God, go. Shine his light. Jesus will come again and make all things new. This is his promise. This is true. And until that day, live, live in humility and grace and share his love with the whole human race. In the name of Jesus, amen.